This is a Geek Leader Podcast, and I'm your host, John Rauta. This show is all about helping us grow as leaders, become better technologists, and improve our lives both at work and at home. I hope you enjoy the show and learn a lot. Hello, world, and welcome to a Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauta. Today's sponsor is A2 Hosting. I've been using A2 Hosting solid state hosting solutions for our website at geekleader.com for many, many years now and absolutely love their support, their service, and all the features that you get. You get access to cPanel. You get all of the things that you can imagine for a great WordPress experience, including their A2 optimized WordPress, which does extra security checks, extra lockdown. It, you can lock down your editor uh, file so you can't edit anything inside there. You get alerts whenever there are file changes that are done. Um, you can also do automatic updates, backups, and more with A2 hosting. So highly recommend it. Go to a geekleader.com slash A2 to get more information and to sign up for their solid state turbocharged speed hosting today. Again, that's a geekleader.com slash A2. All right, Geek Leaders, today I'm honored to have Jeff Perry on the show. He's the host of the Engineering Career Coach podcast um, and also running uh, More Than an Engineer. And we're going to talk a little bit about what uh, engineers need to do to become better leaders and what, what's the the skills that they need to get to advance their career and become uh, better leaders and to move forward in life. So with all that being said, Jeff, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, John. Glad to be here and excited about our conversation today. Yeah, if you don't mind, just tell the audience a little bit about how you got to where you are today, what your background's like, and why is it that you're so passionate about helping engineers? Yeah, uh, thanks for giving me that chance. So, I mean, like most people, my my career is, is uh, you know, sometimes it feels like a winding road. You know, we don't always have everything mapped out like we like we think it's going to be, and uh, and things change, right? So, mm-hmm. uh, background is actually mechanical engineering, then went into software development, uh, back into mechanical manufacturing operations, and got into engineering leadership uh, years ago. And then about five six years ago, I got into doing some training and and coaching, kind of internal to the company that I was working in, and and I had these these moments when I was doing that and. Um, that I just sort of felt like I came alive. Like I was, I was really loving doing what I was doing, where I was really working on the the human personal impact, uh, uh-huh. you know, sort of work. And it, that was sort of mostly a, a side role that I was doing on top of my engineering leadership work. Um, but I just loved it because I could see kind of have this front row seat to to working with people and having them um, move through some some big changes that they were making and had some great stories that came out of that. And so I was starting to look around like, hey, what what can I do a little bit differently? Uh, or maybe how can I incorporate more of that um, that that sort of work into, into what I do? Long story short, there's kind of a career plateau that I found myself in. I knew there was a change that needed to happen. And I decided to, to take the leap and, and go out on my own and kind of combine this uh, wide engineering background and technology background, uh, things that I'd done and, and the engineering leadership work um, with some of this training and coaching work that I wanted to do. And so that's that's what kind of became more than engineering, where I do a lot of leadership and career coaching for engineers and technology professionals. So that's kind of the quick story there. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that's kind of, it's very similar path to, to where I was from uh, more of an IT standpoint, you know, starting into a geek leader, you know, I wanted to do more about building uh, the leadership avenue from, you know, an IT perspective, because a lot of times, and I'm sure you see the same thing. Um, you know, when, when I became a manager for the first time and had to, you know, uh, as I call it, lead geeks, <laughs> um, it was it was very difficult because I didn't have really uh, any formal training. Uh, you know, we had eventually about six months after becoming a manager, they sent me to um, a corporate, I don't know, manager training. But it was more about how to do timesheets properly and, and <laughs> a lot of the HR rules. You know, whenever you're interviewing people and things like that, it wasn't it wasn't really how to lead people. And I didn't get that actual leadership training that that I was looking for. And I'm guessing you you kind of had that same kind of experience. Yeah, I, I had some similar things. I mean, my approach when I became my my first leadership job was just sort of like thrown into the fire, like go figure it out. Um, and, uh, I mean, I had had some leadership experiences, you know, early in my life in different circumstances, but like a formal manager in, uh, in a leadership position. And I was leading a team and like leading projects and leading like new initiatives. And so it was like a lot at once. 
And um, quite frankly, I kind of, I, I really sucked at it um, <laughs> when, I, when I started. <laughs> and um, I mean, one of my experiences just to share some of, some of the, some of the struggles there um, uh, while I was, uh, while I was uh, in, in that role, um, I was, I started working on a part-time MBA program and that was part of me wanting to invest in myself and uh, grow in leadership and some, some other areas there and in business acumen and things too. Uh, but we took a leadership class and as part of that class, uh, they administered a, one of those 360 reviews. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think I got 12 or 13 people that were my team and some peers and some of my leaders that, that I interacted with uh, that, that gave me anonymous feedback. And one of the themes that emerged from that is that Jeff doesn't listen. <laughs> uh, that that uh, I kind of come through with with my ideas and people share them and they either don't feel safe to to share their ideas. Or if they do share them, then I don't really listen and I just sort of go with what I want to do anyway. And that was a realization, just, just one of many that I had as a leader, like, it, okay. And, it, and it's not like, it's not just that I needed to learn how to listen. I need to change my paradigm and my mindset around why I needed to listen to my team. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think sometimes that's how we approach leadership development, sort of like some of the things you experienced there where like, hey, it's about timesheets. It's, it's about the things you need to do, the processes and all that stuff. And yeah, we need to learn that stuff. And even if we're talking about a skill like listening, sometimes we talk about, okay, ask these questions, pause for five seconds and like, okay, that that's great. But but often it's like not just the the pragmatic skills that we're trying to prescribe that we need to shift there. It's the why we need to do that and really caring about the people that we're interacting with and leading and, and having a stewardship uh, over. And so those are some of the, the shifts that I, I'd say I began to make there and, and continue to try and make in, in my work and my life in different circumstances. Yeah, it sounds like those are um, the mindset shifts that you have to do when you're thinking about, because I know as an engineer, you know, a lot of times we think about what are the steps in order to do this and not not, not always getting into the, you know, um, the, the, the reasons long-term of why we do these things and, and what, what is the, the, you know, what, what, what leads to these steps, you know, when you get into like listening. And, and for me, it was one of those things where I had to get into a habit of, I, I could not listen well when I was doing a one-on-one -on -one unless I shut my laptop. And now what I do is I, I do walking one-on-one. -on -one. So we walk around outside and yeah. when I'm out in nature, it just, it's more, uh, I don't know, adept to being able to talk to someone and have a more personal conversation than when I'm in an office, you know? Yeah, totally. I, I, I would do some of that too when I was in the office, um, especially when it was nice weather. It's nice to to move the body and, and just be focused on uh, the person without any any other kind of office distractions and stuff like that. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what kind of um, steps do you have to someone when, whenever they do hear that kind of rough feedback, like, like you got, you know, Jeff doesn't listen and, and you know, what, what are some things that people should do to internalize that and not immediately jump into the defensive? Cause a lot of times we do that. We like to be defensive. Yeah, that, that's a tough thing. Um, when we, uh, and, uh, and, and first of all, uh, let's talk about like the, the way of delivering that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if you're the, the leader or someone delivering that feedback, you know, if I, I mean, I got it from an anonymous survey, so no person was delivering that. It was a, it was an email that got sent to me, right. From, from the results <laughs> of the survey. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but, but often this, this feedback is delivered by a person in, in some form or fashion, right. We're talking about performance reviews or just one-on-ones that are happening. And, and we need to have these sorts of conversations and and one of the the things I like to connect with, you know, engineers and technology people sometimes would like to connect with, you know, maybe some of those other principles that we already know about and connect that with how that affects us as as individuals and leaders. So so for example, like some of Newton's Isaac Newton's laws of motion, one of those is that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. Right. So so think about that from the context of delivering feedback. Okay. If I, as a leader, come into a feedback or correction type uh, conversation, 
and and I am, am mad at this person and I'm going to to deliver, you know, uh, an accusation of some sort, at least what it was going to feel like, then um, they are most likely going to uh, <laughs> Um, react with an equal and opposite reaction and defensiveness and maybe even lobbing back accusations at you, right? Yep. If instead we can shift that a little bit and open up a conversation like that with vulnerability, right? And, and openness. So if I'm a leader saying, hey, I recognize uh, as a leader that I have a responsibility to, to help and support you, Um and, and there are some things that I feel like perhaps I might not be doing as well as I can to support you. So pointing that at, at you and opening you up to vulnerability and even pointing out, you know, here's, here's two or three ways that I feel like I could probably improve here. Do you have any feedback on me for me in, in that? So, so you're beginning that conversation with feedback about you opening up that vulnerability space, which might then have a greater opportunity for them to be more open either to one, ask if you have feedback for them, or two, if when you get to the point when when you are delivering that feedback, then they're more open to receive that, right? You know, an equal and opposite reaction. And, and humans aren't quite as predictable as, you know, just, uh, you know, non-alive pieces of matter that we're pushing around a, a desk or something <laughs> as far as those laws of motion. But but some of those principles and ideas can still be applicable in, in, in some fun ways to, to think about that, right? But, yeah. but as the individual, like me, receiving feedback, uh, you know, um, I, I, I just say that the, the mindset around that is... Uh, taking that of responsibility, right? Um, and, and I've had to to shift some of my mindset around feedback um, as a, I'd say, a recovering perfectionist, if you will, <laughs> um, in really viewing feedback and, and and things like that as a gift. I had, a, I had a mentor who told me that truth is a gift, and when someone tells you the truth and and shares some things, even if it's hard to hear. It's a gift that I can choose to do something with um, and an opportunity there rather than thinking that it's a, a knock against me, who I am as a person, right? And so um, it, seeing the, those opportunities for receiving feedback as, as gifts and opportunities to, to grow and learn and develop, um, which, which changes that whole experience a little bit. Yeah, I have to say, as I've advanced in my career, I used to hate getting feedback, you know, when I was younger and, and early on, because I didn't like to see my mistakes. A lot of times I knew those mistakes were there and I didn't like to see them. But now I'm to the point where I need to hear it, because if I don't, I'll lose sight of what I need to work on. I, I lose sight of the the direction that I need to be trying to 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 get to. And, and you mentioned it early on, you know, this it's always trying to get better. It, it's a, it's a, I always like to say the destination is a mirage. It, it's where we're going, but, you know, we get the right direction, but we're never going to be, get to perfection, but we always got to be striving to get in that, that, that direction. And um, yeah, I think get, getting that feedback and I love what you just said there. Truth is a gift. Getting that, that truth from someone else is really helpful in getting there. Yeah. And, and so, and, and moving through this whole process of, um, like becoming a leader, it, it's mm -hmm. tough. There's so many things to figure out, right? Um, the, the whole shift and and how you think about if you're moving from an individual contributor to a manager uh, or or leader, um, there's so many things that you don't know that you don't know when you yeah. make a shift like that. Um, and and so, uh, as a as a company organization hopefully we provide people the the support the mentorship the the training the the concepts they need to to be able to be successful not just how to uh, put in time cards uh, but a little bit more than that and and more things around values and how to manage different circumstances conflict and all, uh, other sorts of things but again Beyond just the the day to day, this is how you do it because I think that e even if we are trying to develop a leadership skill, sometimes we focus on prescribing the behaviors that we need to do differently, and we neglect the actual true development. Like we're talking about leadership development, we need to develop people as as people and their 
ability to handle complex situations and uncertainty and challenges and, and new forms of stress that they're dealing with. And that's not something you can just throw someone into a workshop for a day uh, or, or take a quick online course and say, this is how you listen. This is how you delegate and all those things. Those, those, are, those are good things to do. We shouldn't not do any of them, but we also need to help people develop cognitively, emotionally in different ways. And it's a little more complex than sometimes, you know, current leadership development work happens. And, and it's a lot more personal because everyone comes from a different place in order to be able yeah. to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you, you know, I agree with you. I think those online courses and stuff are helpful, but they're not the you know, silver bullet. They're not going to, you know, get you right there. You've got to, it's one of those things that has to be, in my opinion, it has to be learned over time. You've got to put in some effort to kind of try to make those behavioral changes and, and learn from them and, and, and evolve into that. Cause you know, just a one day, you know, here's how you listen. Here's how you have one-on-ones. Here's how you, you know, give feedback. Here's how you receive feedback. It doesn't just like flip a switch in your brain and start working. You have to start seeing the value from doing things in those ways and grow into that path. Yeah. There, there's a couple of different types of things. Like, like most, most courses, a, a approach, um, learning leadership, like you would like a technical skill, right? Like yeah. you come from IT and technology and like, Hey, if you need to learn a new networking strategy or, or framework or, or technology or something like that, yeah, you can take a course and you can get the, get the basics. You can do a project and you, you know, it's reasonably straightforward mm -hmm. to learn how to bring on a new technical skill or for someone who's learning a new uh, software language or whatever that is. Right. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's it's pretty straightforward. You, you you take the course, you learn the, the fundamentals and the basics and you practice and, and you do it, right? Sometimes in terms of human development and, and leadership, it's not that straightforward. And so psychologists have actually separated these one way of one, one way of describing these different types of changes. One is like a technical change, like or or, or a technical learning or an adaptive change. And, and so those, those things we were talking about there, like learning a new technology or something, that's a technical change where it's pretty straightforward. Um, we, can, we can get information uh, or from someone else and then you do that. But an adaptive change is an internal process that we need to change us. And it often means that we need to uh, evaluate, address, and change even like our beliefs and values that we hold inside, right? And, and that is not something that someone else can do for us. It, it's internal work, but it needs to be done intentionally. And, um, and, and often a, a coach or, or sometimes a therapist or, or someone else can help guide work. you through, yeah. through that work. Um, but, but we need to actually change our, our belief systems in, mm -hmm. in some cases um, around and assumptions that we're making around how the world works and those mindsets and things because uh, if we don't, then we're going to revert right back to the, our old ways of of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to have, you know, someone like a coach or a mentor or a therapist that you really trust and um, that will give you that truth and, and do it in a way that, you know, doesn't necessarily hurt your feelings, but maybe a little bit, <laughs> uh, but also helps guide you in, in, the, in the path of how, to, how do you fix this and how do you how do you move forward? And uh, it doesn't an optimistic manner. So it's not like, oh, you suck at this, you know, you're going to be you're terrible, but, but more like, you know, these are rooms for improvement. Here's how we can get there. Here's, here's what's going to happen when you start doing these things and give you some hope and, and some belief and benefits going forward. I remember I had a really good mentor as a, you know, um, early leader and that really helped me uh, learn to accept feedback and to kind of write in the way I do things. Yeah. And, and so the, and so those mentors, those, those leaders, those coaches, mm -hmm. and those guides, you might say, mm -hmm. they come in a lot of different forms. Sometimes they're the people who are actual bosses. Sometimes we can find other mentors in our workplace. Sometimes we can find people outside. Sometimes we hire coaches. You know, I, I, I perform that, uh, that role in a lot of people in, in the work that I do now, uh, which is a, a pleasure and, a, and an honor to be able to do that. Um, and, and they can, they can take forms in many different aspects of our life too. Uh, career and leadership is just one, you know, I, I have people who I consider mentors in spiritual, spiritual capacities or people I think about, you know, as I'm growing my family and, and being a 
decent father mm -hmm. uh, to, to my kids and, and things like that. I, people I lean on in different areas of my life, right? Um, and we need to find those people that we can um, really, that can help us through those different stages and, and process as we, we move through different stages of life and, and growth and development. Yeah, I think, um, you know, having that small group of people around you, whether it be like a small group from your church or um, uh, a group at work that you meet with, uh, or just a single person, a mentor or a coach that helps you in life and at work or, or in different areas is really important um, because we don't go through life alone. Um, and, and if you right. do, it's really hard. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And and uh, I, I think we we hopefully learned some of that. Uh, how hard it is to try and do so many things uh, alone and isolated as we move through some of the COVID stuff. And we were forced into some of that. And, you know, maybe some of us felt more of that need for human connection mm -hmm. uh, that we were starved for in, in different circumstances. Uh, but, but whether, whether engineers and technology professionals like to admit it, we're all social beings. <laughs> and some of those, uh, some of those stereotypes around, uh, you know, tech folks um, aren't, aren't helpful. And sometimes, um, push us into thinking that, Hey, we can just operate, just like do my thing. And I don't need to connect with people. I don't need to help from anyone. And I, and I'm a good problem solver. I'm smart. Like, yeah, you are. Um, but we still need support and help and connection with, with people in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, what, what's changing for engineers and leaders today? I know, you know, we mentioned COVID and one of the things that I've seen is a lot, a lot of people move to working from home and now there's kind of a shift of coming back to the office. Um, and, and I know for me, I, I feel like I have to be in the office. There's something about, you know, being at home all the time. Just, I don't, I, I like, I like the connection of people. I like the in-person stuff. So that's where I'm, where I'm gravitating to, uh, or a hybrid a sense where you have a little bit of both, but w what's changing for leaders today? It, it's hard to say like what's changing, um, mm -hmm. because it, it's a little bit different for everyone. I, I think the, the fact that or, or or the one thing that we say is that things are always changing, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the, the realities that leaders will always need to handle is how to deal with change. Like you're not just going to set some process or system or, or culture up and then, you know, just set it and forget it like uh, some of those uh, old infomercials, right? Um, but uh, it, it like being able to adapt and, and adjust and change as technology changes, as society changes, as our way of working, as business models change, as consumer and customer preferences change, like being able to deal with that complexity and that uncertainty is a, a real difficulty that, that leaders need to, to be able to handle. Um, so what's changing well everything is, is changing all the time uh it's not just one thing um and yeah i mean different companies have different uh approaches now with with remote or not remote but that's just one element of so many when it comes to to leading teams these days yeah for sure i, I know um it, you know you have have so much going on when it comes to you know, managing and leading people from different perspectives. And one of the things you talked, we, we talked about it already a little bit is your, the, the shift of the mindset that you have to do from being an individual contributor to being um, a, a leader. And one of that is to grow your people. How, how have you seen um, engineering leaders or how do you coach or help engineering leaders become better at growing their team? And, and I know, let me give you an example. I guess when I first became a manager, I always wanted to like oversee everything and make sure everything that my team was putting out was good. And I, I quickly became the bottleneck for everything that our team was doing. And I didn't have that foresight of growing my team so that I didn't have to be that bottleneck anymore. Um, well, what are some things that you've seen where, where people can shift their mindset a little bit to help grow their, their, their leaders after they make that shift from individual contributor to manager? Yeah. Um, great question. So, one of the, the beauties about doing some of the work that I do where it's so personal is I get to try and drill down to what is it that's really preventing this particular individual leader from really making that appropriate step? Because I've worked with a number of people like, you know, that are similar to your experiences where they really struggle with that delegation. But it's not just like, hey, here's how you delegate. We investigate and dig a little bit deeper into the mindsets and beliefs around 
why they're struggling delegating, right? What is the the belief system that's holding them back? For for some, it's hey, if I don't check all my work or or supervise, you know, every every step of the process, then we're going to have some quality issues, or customers are going to be unhappy, or or this that or other bad thing is going to happen, right? So there are some beliefs around why they are currently micromanaging and not delegating and really letting go and giving ownership to their teams, right? But if they mm-hmm. aren't aware of that, then they can't address that or do anything with that. And and we're just, again, prescribing, hey, start delegating, just like let it happen. But, you know, that internal struggle that, that they have right now, those beliefs are are fighting against uh, their their desire, even if they know that delegating and trusting their teams is the right thing to do, right? For other leaders I, I deal with it, it, or work with, it it could be around, you know, they're not setting boundaries and they're, they're literally sometimes burning themselves out in a way that is detrimental to their health. I had, had one leader who was reeling and took a, took a two month, <laughs> um, kind of health break from from their job when we started working together and be, because she you know, was just running herself ragged and and so we talked about how to appropriately set some of those boundaries um for herself and for her teams um but but again those beliefs that were driving that was that she was building a new team in like the data space in her company that and trying to to build trust with all the other stakeholders around. And she felt like if she didn't do all of that, then they weren't going to be able to grow and succeed in what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so she took so much of that on herself um, and, and didn't appropriately set expectations for the others who were expecting things of her and for her team. And so she just took all that on herself and, and physically burnt out um, it and had kind of a breakdown. So um, everyone and like their approach to this is a little bit different. And so we need to find, you need to find someone who you can work with and talk to, who can be that, that mentor or guide, uh, be that third party. who can maybe see things that you can't see, help you gain some more self-awareness around not just what you need to change, but why you need to change that and why you're currently resisting making some of those shifts. Right. So, yeah, so, so John, just curious, just curious for you, mm-hmm. um, kind of flip the microphone here a little <laughs> bit as you were working through that, right. And that challenge of, um, being able to let go and trust your team. What do you think was originally driving that reluctance to do that for a while? Uh, the, the shortest answer I can give is ego. Um, you, you know, and it happens to a lot of, um, engineers when they get promoted up, right? You're one of the better developers on your team. So you become the manager of the development team, right? And, you know, in doing so, I always felt like my way was better. So I needed to yeah. double check their, you know, the other people's work to make sure that it was done my way. And then mm-hmm. what I learned in real life is, well, first I learned that I don't scale as a person. And yes. I can't, you know, if I have seven people reporting to me, I can't, you know, work enough to, to do everything my way. And then I, I, I got surprised and shocked when one of my junior developers on my team did something in a way that I never would have thought of doing it. And it worked so much better. You know, it was, mm. it was far more efficient processing wise. And it was just like a much better way of doing something. I'm like, ah, oh, why didn't I think of that? And then I thought, then that's when it like, just like a light just went off in my head. It's like, because I'm doing it my way. I need to let people do it their way. And I'll be surprised every now and then, you know, yeah. And and to realize that sometimes, you know, good enough is good enough. You know, you mentioned that you're a recovering perfectionist and I had to take the, I was too. And I had to realize that sometimes good enough is good enough. And, and it's good enough for a reason because it's good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. We don't need those five nines for everything. Totally. Totally. Sometimes, uh, you know, say done is better than perfect. Yes. <laughs> Especially uh, like when you're developing software that's going to be updating, you know, quickly anyway, and, and speed to markets, you know, crucial, mm-hmm. uh, but, you know, you know, there's a bug here. Well, let's make sure we have good error handling for that bug and put it out and we'll fix it in the next release. Yeah, totally. 
So really? yeah, that, that was, that was my, my experience there was, you know, realizing I got surprised by somebody realizing that I couldn't keep up with the work and my team was, you know, not working very hard because they didn't have to, because I was the bottleneck. And then seeing that, you know what, good enough is good enough for a reason. Yeah, that's great. So how, how do you recommend people that, let's say, um, you know, you're just moving into that leadership role and you don't have a mentor or a coach or someone that can kind of help you out? How, how do people go about finding those, especially if they're, you know, took a position where they're remote and they really don't know a whole lot of people in the organization, except for the people they're working directly with? Um, how, how do you recommend people to find find someone and help them? Yeah. So as far as mentors, I'm pretty big on finding mentors and people to support you like this, both internal and external to your organization. So finding someone internal to the organization, because they're going to have some insights and awareness and things, mm -hmm. you know, in into the organization uh, that, that are going to be helpful. And I mean, likely you have a direct boss that you can lean on a little bit, but um, I like finding someone who's not your boss as well, who isn't directly tied, obviously depends on the size of the organization, but isn't directly tied to your particular success on your projects and your team and things like that, but that has other networks, connections and insights been around maybe a little bit longer in uh, in the organization and in leadership in general that, that can, can help connect you with things or may, might provide some insights that, that might be helpful. Um, so... I mean, one of the ways I, I think about finding someone like that is just like, who's doing some things that, that you think are cool or is there has been places that, that you're curious about uh, to learn more about. And, and that mentorship can take many different forms in terms of how it operates in terms of, yes, I can help you with um, insights on the, um, on, on growing leadership, but you can get career insights and, you know, these are different paths you could take as a leader uh, or different uh, areas that you might consider growing, right? Because because some people want to go deeper in the, into the tech. Some people want to go into leadership. Pe some people want to move towards the product side. There's all sorts of different directions that you can take. And so getting those insights is great. Uh, on the other side, getting someone who is external to your organization, that's usually one of the roles that I play for a lot of people who is, is third party and, you know, doesn't care about, you know, whether you stay or go in your current organization, right? But is more interested in you developing as a person and, and defining the, the areas that are important to you mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and helping you achieve those goals, Right. And so that can that can take the the form of a of a paid coach or the, just if there's people who are in in the industry that you're in now or you're curious about other industries that you can connect with and, and grow some relationships from, it's you know the operative question sometimes is uh, who do you know now who might be able to provide those insights and um, you know another question to ask is like who do you want to know like who's yeah, doing some one. of the things that. Uh, you'd be really curious about that you want to get to know and how can you find some way of connecting with them and, and reaching out? Sometimes, you know, plenty of people might might ignore uh, your outreach, but plenty of people, if you're really just interested in them, not trying to get anything out of them, like, hey, I'm trying trying to get a job uh, at your company. Like, like, don't start with that. Like, yeah. just start with you are genuinely interested in them and who they are and and trying to invest in that relationship. And you're going to be much more successful. Plenty of people will will still ignore you and, and not say yes, but but some people will, and and you just never know who who those who those people will be sometimes. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, I can't remember what book it was that I read. I read a book some where they mentioned that everybody needs a mentor, and it was one of my early leadership books. And I went through this formal um, leadership training about a year, maybe about a year into being a manager. And all of our executives at our company, all, all the EVPs and higher were, were speaking. And it, it sounded like a very scripted HR type thing where they ended, ended the thing was, if anybody's interested in mentorships, you know, send me an email. And I emailed every single one of them. Cool. And they all said no, <laughs> except for one. And uh, it happened to be, you know, the, the guy that was over our sales team. Hmm. And yeah. You know, when I'm coming from technology and he's in sales, he, he responded back and he's like, I don't know anything about tech and I probably can't help you, but 
I think it's interesting and I love the fact that you reached out. So yeah, let's, let's give this a whirl and see how it goes. So we met for lunch and started having a conversation and, you know, he gave me a whole lot of insights of how, like, how does sales see technology and Mm. how do we view that and things that I never would have thought of that have helped me significantly in my career long-term, you know, outside of that company. (laughs) So I think it's really important when you are looking for someone within your company to find people, you know, outside of your area, because you can get a lot of insight from that. Um, but I also love the fact that, you know, finding someone outside your company too, that will tell you, Hey, it's time to leave. Cause sometimes you need that. And you're not going to get that from, from an executive within your company. Usually. Usually I, I I've heard some great stories about some people are like, yeah, I mean, you're not in the best place to, to grow here. It's time to go. And it's, it's cool. Um, I, I had some people that, that were, were cool like that with, with me when I decided to, to leave and start uh, more than engineering. And, and it, it's amazing to have people uh, like that, but it's, it's probably the exception to the rule typically <laughs> uh, to, to have stuff like that. Yeah. So um, tell me, what is the typical like um, coaching uh, engagement look like? Yeah. So there's a, there's a number of different things that I work with people on. Um on, on the leadership side, it ends up being a lot more custom. I have a number of people who are small business owners or, or people who are looking at uh, mo- making that move to, to leadership. And I've got some group programs and do some individual stuff uh, around how to help people through that. In fact, right now, as, as we talk, I'm in the midst of a, of a group program. These are it's a, a small group of people who are moving through. And we, and we do a number of different live sessions all, all together and do a little bit of one-on-one work on trying to to identify some of these things we've talked about. What is the what are those mindsets and beliefs that might be driving that that resistance to the big change need to to work on? We work on things like productivity and and networking, building professional relationships and leadership uh, competencies uh, to help build some of those things. And and then we try and personalize that a little bit with some one on one work. Um, on the other side, I do a lot of the, the career coaching. This is for people who are, for some reason or another, need uh, or are recognizing that, hey, I need to make a change. And either they they know what that change is, or sometimes they're, <laughs> they're not sure where, where engineers and technologists can go so many different directions in their careers, like we've talked about. They need to get some career clarity, uh, but, but maybe some of the experiences they've had in their work have sort of taken a hit in their confidence and mindsets. So, so we work on that. We can certainly work on pragmatic stuff like resume and and LinkedIn strategies and all that stuff and interview prep and and things like that. But I try and take a really holistic approach to to this process so that people aren't just getting like, hey, you know, they they come in saying, I I want a new job. Yeah, we want to reach that goal, but I want you to be a a different person and thinking differently um, so you can be successful through this change and beyond. And so it's it's a pretty cool opportunity and honor to help people through some of these big uh, changes and opportunities that they're seeing in front of them. Awesome. So how can people um, connect with you and learn more about what you're doing? Um, and you know, if they're interested in coaching, how, how can they you know get that as well? And and where can they find your podcast? Yeah, perfect. So so the podcast is uh, called the Engineering Career Coach uh, Podcast. It's it's done in in connection with um, the Engineering Management Institute, uh, who actually owns a podcast, and I'm just the primary host, and and uh, love doing that. Been doing that for a couple of years now, um, and so uh, you can find that in any any podcast platform, pretty much out there. Um, it, I, I did create something just for uh, listeners of a geek leader here, and go grab that that resource. Uh, it's called the Career Clarity Checklist. So for those who are trying to, to map out, you know, some of those things that they might want to do or they're considering doing and, and also some of those deeper motivations like we talked about, those beliefs mm-hmm. around why you want to do it and go grab this at www.engineeringcareeraccelerator.com slash AGL and make sure to put those W's in there uh, at the start to make that work well for you. But uh, a great resource that, that I hope is helpful for people um, trying to chart their path. Is leadership right for them? If so, great. If not, then maybe there's some other paths uh, or maybe there's a timing issue. Uh, I've got some other resources too, but that's the first thing I point people to and then we can connect further. Awesome. And I'll link that up in the show notes too at geekleader.com. So that'll be right there in the show notes uh, for everyone to go to. And we appreciate that. And thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on the show. 
John, it's a pleasure. Glad to be here and uh, wish you and listeners nothing but continued success. If you enjoyed that episode, please uh, leave a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. I'd greatly appreciate that. And also, don't forget to check out merch. We have some T-shirts that uh, I've designed that are on at geeklyder.com. Um, you can click on the merchandise uh, section there and check that out. And also, don't forget about the books from our guests. So if you like this guest and other guests that have written books, please um, go ahead and check that out at geekleader.com. I would greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they would too.